Okay, so welcome to today's seminar. And today's speaker is uh, Wolfgang Lert from CERN. He would be talking of some new developments in the subject of uh, elliptic genera motivated by the weak gravity conjecture. So uh, over to Wolfgang. We get started without delay. Okay, thanks for the invitation. As I said, I would like to be physically present, but, but uh, not these days. So I like to report some on some work done with uh, with uh, Sun Ju Lee and Kuli Lockhart and Timo Weigand over the last couple of years. However, now with a special emphasis today on elliptic genera in four dimensions, and uh, that sort of that there's sort of various concepts circulating around this kind of um, topic. Do you see the mouse arrow, by the way? Do you see? Yes. 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 yes, yes. Okay. Good. So we have this kind of relationships. Uh, big gravity, F theory, dualities, uh, Gromov of Witten variance on four folds, and uh, uh, quasi modular anomaly uh, properties of, of, of Jac Jacobi forms and modular anomalies and all the wild things. So, um, however, be warned, uh, there's uh, very often the word elliptic coming up here, and it has different meanings. Of course, these meanings are all related uh, by some dualities in one way or the other. But I hope one is not going to be confused. So the, there's elliptic genus, for example, which refers to the world sheet. Then there's elliptic vibration, where elliptic refers to the fiber of, of a Calabria manifold and so on. Now, uh, indeed, as was already mentioned, the motivation was uh, the gravity conjectures. And uh, the point is that often physical consistent requirements traditionally things like anomaly cancellation, for example, turn out to be guaranteed by mathematical properties or geometric uh, properties uh, of manifolds and, and so on. And the idea was to look uh, into um, sort of compactifications or non-trivial manifold to see how, how, how this is compatible with uh, various weak gravity conjectures. And examples, important examples are of course uh, the conjecture that there should not be any global symmetries in quantum gravity or related uh, infinite distances in the modular space should lead to asymptotically massless towers of states, uh, which could be either KK modes or, or tensionless strings. And the mathematics behind this is uh, the generation, the generation geometry of Calabria manifolds, which is a rich subject in itself. Yeah, so that, that is compatible, but I'm not going to talk about this. I sort of aim more for the second topic, um, at least as a motivation. There's a statement that super extreme states should exist in, in theories into which extremely black holes uh, should be able to decay in order to avoid massive remnants. And that is tied to modular properties of Jacobi forms and, and elliptic genera, and uh, ultimately comes from uh, also from elliptic. From, from geometric properties of elliptically fibered uh, Calabria manifolds. So that is sort of the motivation. And uh, here are some of the main results. Uh, I will explain in more detail later. So we have been finding that mirror symmetry and Calabria four folds with a U1 gauge symmetry in the background of some fluxes, four fluxes D4, determine certain relative chrome of Witten invariance and they allow to determine and compute non-perturbative elliptic genera in four dimensions. And non-perturbative means, for example, heterotic background with some extra in its five points, you know, small instantons or something like this on top of them. Yeah. Then as it turned out, uh, by surprise, uh, was that these elliptic genera in four dimensions, which looked very simple at first sight, actually are very rich. And in particular, in general, generically, we'll have some derivative piece which spoils, uh, spoils modularity yeah, in an unexpected way. And that gives rise then to the appearance of um, quasi Jacobi forms and relatedly novel kinds of anomaly equations. Then there are physics applications of this. Uh, I, I will mention them only very briefly, um, such as anomaly cancellation, the gravity conjectures for four-dimensional theories, this n equal one supersymmetry, elliptic holomorphic anomalies. 
So let's let's set the first the stage as a framework. So we talk about F theory, which is nothing but uh, type two B strings uh, on a non perturbative seven brain uh, geometry on some background, compactified on elliptically fibered color we all K folds. Yeah, so this means they, they are just fibered. You have a little elliptic curve sitting over every point of the base manifold, and sometimes there are singularities, seven brain locations where these vibrations, where the fibers become singular. And the question is, uh, what happens if we have some curve, C0 here in the base and uh, a two cycle and the D3 brain wraps around it? And it, especially what happens if this, uh, the volume or the size of this one shrinks to zero volume. So just uh, from, from dimensions, this means you would expect a massless or tangentless string appearing, but there's much more to this, first of all, the question is, can this actually shrink to zero? If, you know, does a location in the a locus in the modular space exist at all? And it turns out um, the, the kind of shrinking you can do are determined by um, the self intersection properties of the cycle. So if it's negative, then the singularity can be shrunk at finite distance and that typically leads to non perturbative effects like, like um, non-critical strings, E-strings, uh, decoupled gravity, and so on. So this is a well-known subject, but I won't, I won't be talking about this today. But if the safe intersection of this curve is, is positive or zero, then uh, it can only be shrunk at infinite distance in modular space uh, in, in, in relation to some other quantity. Yeah? And in particular, vanishing safe intersection means you can get solitonic heterotic strings. So let, let me just point out a little general feature of this kind of thinking. Namely, uh, assume we have a kind of parameter in the modular space and uh, which corresponds to some gauge coupling and you go um, to, to vanishing gauge coupling, but while keeping gravity, uh, not decoupling gravity. So the relevant piece is here sub-manifold, a base of this vibration. And if you want to keep the gravity in the game, uh, the Planck mass should not go off to infinity, then, uh, we require the volume of this manifold B2 be constant. On the other hand, a weak gauge coupling typically means that the cycle becomes very large. Uh, but that means because of the product in a way, the, the, the volume of, of the total space is supposed to be stay constant. It means that uh, we have a uh, cycle, uh, this two cycle, a unique one, uh, becoming a, a zero size, it shrinks to zero. So in other words, whenever we have the situation, A, keep gravity in the game, B, make the gauge coupling weak, so, in, so, so it wants to turn into a global symmetry, and automatically you have a situation like this, uh, that something, something shrinks to zero size and becomes massless. So the upshot is that uh, then we get a asymptotically tangentless String, heterotic string, for example. Uh, and that is, of course, one of the main tenets of uh, the weak gravity conjecture that, um, that there's sort of uh, asymptotically tensionless tower of, 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 of string excitations um, coming down if you switch off the gauge coupling. Now, this seems very naive, and this picture is very naive, but of course, the, the physics intuition is correct. And there exists a very mathema uh, powerful mathematical theorems behind uh, you know, the geometry of, of large distance degenerations, the degenerations of color VR spaces, be it large complex structure limits or, or large scalar parameter limits. There have been lots of papers in physics literature recently on this subject. Yeah. Now, uh, in passing, just, just let me point out um, some main results in this context. One question, for example, would be, can we possibly run into something, uh, in something, in some, in some bad surprise when, when going into these limits? For example, what happens, um, can it happen that two, two string theories become simultaneously tensionless or higher dimensional brains become the dominant degrees of three dimensional energy? So, no, it cannot happen. Yeah? So by, by doing a relatively general analysis based on mathematical theorems one can show, and that is what we call the emergent string conjecture, that the only situation which can happen either is that uh, a KK tower appears as leading the use of freedom, which amounts to decompactification, or if you stay in the same dimension, 
uh, weakly coupled uh, asymptotically tensional string appears. Uh, so this, this goes as far as, as this physical application. Now let's turn to um, more formal stuff and come to heterotic, well, elliptic genera of uh, in particular heterotic strings, um, but, but with the emphasis on non perturbative phenomena. So we know that the elliptic genus is some kind of um, string generalization of an index. Uh, it's a partition function in, in the parity sector and it encodes protected um, um, but a protected uh, more or less deformation invariant subsector of the spectrum and also importantly underlies the Green-Schwartz anomaly cancellation mechanism as was pointed out by Schelling and so on many years ago. So we consider here um, to be definite uh, zero, uh, zero comma two sequence model in two dimensions with some extra Fermion, uh, well, Fermion number operators insertions in order to soak up the zero modes. You know, so the whole thing is non vanishing. And we also gauge or refine the thing by putting a, a U1 charge Q. And here's some kind of caveat this Q is a real gauge symmetry in the left moving sector. Uh, depend the model dependent thing is not the, uh, a left moving R current uh, because we have anyway only a zero two. Um, and super smitty to start with. So, so this is a generic U1 current or charge operator. And naively, this is a holomorphic or meromorphic function, as we know, due to the index property. And uh, it will have an expansion of this form, some, some vacuum shift energy, and then we have expansion coefficients, which are degeneracies, and, and they're labeled by excitation level and U1 charge. And as it's well known since the early days, this has distinguished modular properties. And in the context of elliptic gender of heterotic strings, it has a modular weight, which is essentially negative. <clears throat> now, um, let's see what we can do with it. Um, with the F-theory setup, namely, we want to use it to compute the elliptic genus of emergent heterotic strings, uh, which become tensorless or almost tensorless in some asymptotic limits. The advantage of this is that we have a non perturbative setup. Yeah? And of course, it could also be other strings. It doesn't need to be a dual heterotic string, but it can also be uh, strongly coupled uh, other theories, uh, other strings or mixtures of heterotic strings with uh, um, um, e strings or whatever, yeah, but we focus especially on this situation. And there's a duality between F theory, F theory on S1. So we have the BPS string in six dimensional wrapping on this S1. And then we have quantum numbers, namely the wrapping number, the K momentum, or U1 charge. And that's dual to M theory on in five dimensions, where we have the BPS particle in five dimensions. And that corresponds to an M2 brain wrapped around a special curve which is a linear combination of the curve we, we focus initially in, in C0, which is the base here. Then it can wrap n times around the fiber. And then we want to have a U1, and, and then we, we need something else, namely a so-called fiber curve, where we have sort of R wrappings on this one, and N and R are just the momentum and the U1 charge in, in this other language. And uh, the, the wrapping of, uh, on, on C0 is set to one. Uh, we have only a single single web string, uh, what we want to consider. And uh, the, the parameters here in this elliptic vibration, uh, in this theory, uh, are just geometrical parameter here, the killer parameter of the elliptic fiber or the size parameter of this fiber curve. Now, uh, what this defines what is called relative BPS invariance. So these are not the most general BPS invariants coming from this elliptic color Biao, but just those which are related to this, uh, in the, relative to this base curve C0. Yeah? So they have this label. And uh, now uh, for, for single wrappings for primitive uh, C0, then they are nothing but the ordinary BPS invariants, the chromo witten invariants actually related to this Calabero manifold in this subsector, so such that the elliptic genus becomes just the n equal to prepotential in four dimensions. Yeah. If we would to compactify further to four dimensions, it would be the prepotential. Yeah. So the elliptic genus itself has this structure. <clears throat> 
Now, also well known is that whenever you have this refinement, the parameter C, it is a U1 background field for us. Uh, the elliptic genes has well defined uh, modular properties, namely, it's a so called Jacobi form, which means it transforms on the modular transformations in a particular way, but it has also double periodicity. Uh, you know, it has a shift symmetry up to some extra phase, extra factor here. Huh? So there's another quant uh, another label. So that depends. Well, the Jacobi form is characterized by this uh, modular weight, which is negative, and also by an index. And the index is roughly speaking, um, well, the scaling of, of the charge lattice of, of the U1, or in, in this context, is a geometrical quantity, which is just given by the intersection form of this base curve C0 times something which is called the height pairing, which is a geometric object, which is needed to define the U1 in the first place. Yeah. So this is uh, a top There object. are these multidimensional uh, generalizations of yes, Jacobi of forms. So where Z can be many, it can take values in some lattice. Yes. Right? Yes, can you can be can, can, be violent, can be violent variant Jacobi forms and so on. But there's a reason why I focus on U1 because that's a sense of the story in four dimensions. I'm, I'm a bit fluffy here about the dimension, and so far we are talking about six dimension theories. In four dimensions, the, the U1 will be the essential ingredient. Yeah? But of course, all of this can be generalized to multi U1s. There exist actually the gravity conjectures. If you have several new ones, you have this convex hull condition and so on. So there's various things one can do with it. <clears throat> so we consider you one for, for a certain reason. Just recall that it's not the the U1, which is which is a spin. Yeah? It's a really god honest U1 uh, symmetry. And uh, it's known, of course, that the space of Jacobi forms is finitely generated as a ring. Uh, this means uh, we need just a computer find that number of covariant invariants in a given example, and then we can fit it to this uh, to this uh, to linear combination of these generators, and then we can get the exact result. So that's all well known. And uh, here a very simple example: um, we consider a particular elliptic Calabi-Yau, namely a vibration of a one hertz uh, surface F1. So this is a ratio. This is a vibration, a rational vibration, which so P1 fiber over another one, uh, doesn't matter really, with an extra U1. And then in this particular example, um, it turns out, well, one can write the, write the elliptic genus in exactly this form. It expands like this. And the point is, uh, if we now switch off the gauging or the refinement, then it turns out to the very well known expression, uh, E46 or eta to the 24. And we meet here this number 480, which is just 20 times the Euler number. So this is a very long expression for the elliptic genus, the heterotic elliptic genus on K3. So um, now, um, since the elliptic genus is a Jacobi form, it has automatically some properties. For example, it has a theta expansion. This means it can be expanded in some coefficient function time the theta functions. And the theta function by itself uh, can be viewed as a partition function of a free periodic boson in two dimensions. And it has some built-in relation between charge and excitation numbers. Uh, so the theta function is this very one form. And this means there's some extra structure in the game. In particular, the states organized in certain orbits characterized by this discriminant. Uh, this is index times excitation number minus charge squared. And according to um, what you know, states exist and what not, I mean, one, one can sort of define the notion of Jacobi forms as being either holomorphic or weak or cusp forms and so on. And I was putting here a picture which shows the various spectral flow orbits. You know, dots with the same color uh, are in the same, it's the same uh, uh, value of delta. Uh, so we have this organizing pattern. Now, what does it buy? Yeah, it maps back to now the gravity conjectures. And there is, um, it's known, I mean, there's conjecture that not only you have to have super extreme states uh, into which um, massive black holes, extreme black holes can decay, which is also uh, related to, the, to this notion of gravity must be the weakest force. Uh, 
Uh, but uh, there are other conditions or conjectures, namely that uh, in particular the super extending states should lie on a lattice. So, and the point is that this uh, the copy property of the elliptic genus implies exactly what we want to have. Namely, if we have it this in, this in this particular example, we can plot the maximally charged states in, for every given excitation level. Then the states with vanishing discriminant are the super extremal states, uh, and uh, the blue ones are uh, extremal states. And if we go very far to infinity, then they, they can turn into black holes. You know? They will have they will asymptote black holes, but the super extremal states won't correspond to objects with, uh, with a smooth horizon. Yeah, so they are more or less particle states, um, not um, maybe sitting on the surface of black holes or something, but it's not, um, they're, they're not black holes. So we see very nicely that indeed the massive black holes can decay kinematically into the super extremal states. Moreover, um, the super extremal states lie on a lattice, the maximal ones at least, as, as required. So this sort of innocent property of, uh, well, it's not, I mean, it seems to be quite convoluted by uh, invoking black holes and so on, but uh, it's just the mathematics of the Jacobi forms and that traces back, of course, to the properties of these elliptic vibrations, just guarantees uh, that it's, it is just consistent or compatible with it. Right? Now, this stuff, of course, is very well known in the black hole community and since at least 10 or 15 years, I mean, there were many papers being written on this. The situation was, was slightly different, namely, one deals with spinning strings, namely, one doesn't consider you one charge, but a, but a spin. There's a, there's a situation is a bit more complicated, maybe more interesting. And uh, there are so-called polar states, which sit here, which has some particular properties, and they don't exist in the setting. Yeah? We have a simplified setting. So all of this is very well known, not surprising. And uh, this is was uh, was just a warm up. Are there questions at this point? If not, then let's go a little bit beyond this. Namely, consider a slightly different compactification. Again, F theory on a free fold, but now um, an elliptic vibration over the petzl surface. It again leads to some kind of dual emergent heterotic string on some six dimensions, so you could say in a K3 surface. However, it's not fully perturbative. There is some kind of NS5 brand effect and it, that is signaled by this appearance by this quasi-modular function E2. And if we switch off the re refinement, then what we find is the elliptic genus of K3 as before, plus an extra piece, which we call the transition piece. So that uh, the, the, the index at the master's level is not 480, but, but 420. Uh, so that is just due to the fact that here we have extra massless tensor multiplet on a hyper -multiplet, so that there's a change of chirality. This is a non-perturbative non background and corresponds to our five brain small instanton transition. So that's just to say that in this more general geometric set setting, there is not just the elliptic genus of K3, but there are also variants uh, where you have uh, non-perturbative non uh, dressings of the situation. You can get uh, this kind of situation under, under control in this way. Now, what does it do here is, oops, no, is uh, now in this case, we, we, we saw the appearance of this function. Wolfgang, what is the calculation you're doing to get these expressions? Can you just tell us the words? Here? Yeah. yeah, yes. Okay, um, mirror symmetry, elliptic vibration, color Biao. So, so you do it on the F theory side and- On the F theory side, we take a color Biao, mm -hmm. then uh, the geometry is specified, say by, by some Mori vectors or some, some charge vectors of, of, the, of the linear sigma model. And then uh, there, there's a very straightforward algorithm to compute the, the Como Fitness variance for this. And then one picks out exactly, I mean, one has to define this base curve C0, and one, one consider the invariance which, which corresponds to this curve C0 plus N times elliptic fiber plus R times uh, fiber curve. And then one assembles these, these numbers in, in a generating function, and then one fits it with uh, the ansatz here of the Jacobi forms of the right modular weight and, and an index. And that gives it this result. 
Thank you. So, so, so in this case, there was this E2 showing up and it's known, of course, that it's not really modular. It is a quasi-modular function in particular has this anomalous extra piece and is also well known. Uh, and then that goes back in physics literature to Felikens and Warner many years ago already, that this can be repaired by augmenting this function by some extra non-holomorphic piece called E2 hat here. And there's a physics interpretation of this. This is not an arbitrary procedure. Namely, uh, the interpretation is that there are extra zero modes from a different branch in the modular space in the geometry. Zero modes typically give rise to these non holomorphic objects in such a way that this forms a modular completion and makes a whole partition function or the genus uh, modular invariant. So there, there's a reason for this. And uh, the holomorphic anomaly, which is associated to this, so if you have a partition function, you'll be genus, we can now take a formal derivative with regard to E2. Equivalently, we can take an anti-holomorphic um, derivative with regard to tau bar. Then it will focus on this transition term, and that is E4 squared. And that has a nice interpretation. Um, that was in particular uh, nicely shown by, by Hakehat and, and Guli Lockhart and Waffa. That corresponds to the phenomenon that the heterotic string can be viewed as a bound state of two E strings. Yeah? So we have M9 brains here. This is a Horaba Witten picture essentially. Then we have the heterotic string goes between the boundaries, and then we put an M5 brain, and then we have an E string. E -string. And there is now uh, a zero mode, namely the relative location of the E-strings, that's sort of a free parameter, that sort of non-compact direction. And that leads to zero mode, which is responsible for this, um, what is in tau. So that reflects an interesting physics, namely the heterotic string is a bound state of two E-strings, each with the partition function given by the square root of, of the holomorphic anomaly. So all of this is well known since many years. And now we turn to, um, the new stuff, which is more complicated, namely elliptic general four dimensions, chiral four dimension uh, theories. So we consider now F theorem and four folds, again, with uh, some suitable curve to shrink. And uh, first of all, for chiral theory, in order to have any kind of massless chiral spectrum, we need to have a four fold, four form flux background switched on. Satisfying certain the uh, certain conditions like like um, maintaining supersymmetry and so on, some quantization condition and so on. Yeah? But we need some for, uh, flux background, and the point is, and that I will say in, in a moment, emphasize in a moment, that Kromov and Witten invariants on four folds are intrinsically defined only with regard to such a background flux. Yeah? They, they don't exist without such an object. Yeah? So they intrinsically defined. And the elliptic genus, then, by this formula uh, I was saying already before, um, the modular weight is minus one, so that's odd, that odd Jacobi form is anti-symmetric in C, and therefore vanishes if we switch off C. So therefore, we need an extra U1 refinement in order to have a non-vanishing object in the first place. And that is, of course, mirrored in physics, the Green-Schwarz canceling term, which is um, interaction between the B field and um, gauge field in four dimensions is, is, is B times F. So there's a trace Q sitting here. So this can only be non-vanishing if there's a U1 factor in the game. Uh, so the whole story really rests on, 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 a, on the one here. That, that's why we introduced it in the first place. Now what we will find are intriguing interrelationships between flux background, modular properties of the elliptic genus, and the new kinds of anomalies. And it will be consistent with specific gravity conjecture, but a bit more subtle. And uh, I won't have time to mention uh, other aspects like modify anomaly cancellation mechanism, reflecting some kind of mysterious hidden structure. And there also, well, I can apply the thing, uh, the thing also to novel non perturbative object like generally four dimensional E strings and so on, but I won't talk about this. Now comes a little bit of math. Yeah? So 
uh, there is uh, a very uh, intrinsic in the relationship between uh, chrome of Whitney invariance and the flux background. So let's 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 recall what the chrome of Whitney, uh, Whitney invariance are doing. They um, count uh, stable holomorphic maps of Riemann surfaces into the two homology of, of the color Biao with some punctures fixed, as you like, uh, and then some subject to some incidence relation. This means there are some requirements that they intersect with some devices in, in a certain way. And that comes uh, about in the following. The virtual dimension of the modular space is given by this well-known formula. So for three faults, this term drops and, and there's nothing uh, particular going on. But for four faults, it turns out that for genus zero, that this is one. So they need to have one point fixed yeah. And that uh, is exactly, um, say in physics, if you, if you uh, formulate this in terms of a two-dimensional conformal field theory, this means essentially that correlation functions need to have an insertion of a flux vertex operator. Yeah. So the very definition of this chromophytic invariance involves already the notion of a flux, they need to be pinned to some flux, roughly speaking. Yeah. The other noteworthy feature is that don't exist invariance for genus larger than one, because this um, becomes negative, but cannot construct reasonable invariance out of um, higher genus human surfaces it, for four faults. So uh, now the invariance we are after, the genus zero invariance are computable via mirror symmetry for four faults, which is also an old subject. And uh, the relevant piece here for us is uh, here we look at the four flux, which is an element of H22. And this splits into a horizontal and a vertical piece and some remainder. And the mirror symmetry exchanges these two pieces. Uh, the vertical piece corresponds to wedging one one forms. So that's generated in this way. And the horizontal piece, horizontal and vertical refers to the Hodge diamond, of course. That comes from going sideways in the Hosh diamond, and this means um, deforming the holomorphic four form. Yeah. And correspondingly, um, you have two expressions in, in uh, you know, related by mirror symmetry. That's a sort of the complex structure type of expression in quotation marks. Here uh, we have a two-dimensional prepotential corresponding to type two strings on this fourfold, which is a wedge product of G four times the four form. That's in a way the, this, the famous Kukov uh, um, uh, superpotential. And mirror to it is now the sort of instanton type of object where we have the invariance. Uh, so we can apply the same method as before to compute this invariance, except that we have also to deal with uh, the background for flux. Now, if you have elliptic vibrations, as, as we have uh, for F-theory, we have extra structure. First of all, not all fluxes can be lifted from two dimensions to four dimensions. So what I was just saying before is just type 2A on the fourfold, which gives a two-dimensional theory, but we want to have an object in four dimensions in the elliptic genus. Uh, so that, that cannot be done for all the fluxes. And the surprising feature is also that the, the various partition functions um, related to various choices of fluxes, and they have different modular weights under, under modular transformations. This was written down first by, by Hagehat, and um, I don't remember the name, or Strabi, whatever, and, and Yao uh, a while ago. And the point is uh, one should just adapt a, a certain basis for H22 for the fluxes, uh, which are sort of as an eigenbasis for the fluxes. So we have a weight zero, minus one, and minus two piece. And that refers simply, if we take these fluxes and put them in a partition function, we compute the invariance and put them here, then uh, the, this partition function have a modular weight given by W. Uh, so that, that this is what, what is meant by this label here. Uh, particular fluxes produces via mirror symmetry, uh, computing invariance, partition functions of different modular weight. And the point is that only the minus one fluxes, the objects which have minor, a modular weight minus one can be straightforwardly lifted to four dimensions in a, in a Lorentz invariant manner. And it is exactly these functions we are interested in because these will have the interpretation of elliptic genus. Yeah? And indeed the very definition of the H minus one 
is in, intrinsically tied to the choice of, uh, of a U1 factor in the geometry. Yeah? So, so that, that is completely consistent. You need to have a U1, then you have an object which you can lift from two to four dimensions and then it will be the Lipty genus. And the other fluxes, so zero minus two, cannot be straightforwardly lifted to four dimensions, at least in a Lorentz invariant way. And, and they just remain, the interpretations are two dimensional super potentials or uh, pre potentials. Okay, so we are a step closer. And now uh, imagine we, we, we take these ingredients, we have a fourfold, we, we constructed, constructed more generators, we pick up a, 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 a curve C0, then we have the elliptic fiber and some, some extra fiber and curve. It chooses the flux in, in the right way, that, that's the minus one flux, and then we consider this partition function, we assemble everything together. And then the big surprise was, well, the whole thing is not modular. And it's also not quasi-modular, it's, it's just terrible. And then only uh, a year or so later it was realized actually that the whole thing has an extra piece, which is a derivative of another partition function namely of a different flux sector. Here we are in the flux sector with minus one modular weight, but we have just some surprising extra piece, which is a derivative. Now derivative, of course, immediately spoils modularity and double periodicity because the transformations involve, of course, um, the background U1 field Z. Yeah? So as always, derivatives break local symmetries. So if we have a Z derivative or a tau derivative acting on the Jacobi form, then we produce these anomalous pieces the E2 is very well known uh, coming from a tau derivative. But if we have Jacobi forms, then we have also a new piece E1. And E1 is defined by this. Yeah. So E2 is, 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 up, is derivative of log eta, and here it's the derivative of log theta 1. And as such, it has a pole of 1 over z. So this is a meromorphic form E1. And the funny thing is uh, that we have also other meromorphic forms here divisions by phi minus one, two, for example. And uh, the poles always cancel. And they have to because the left-hand side of these equations have no poles, they're meromorphic objects, uh, holomorphic objects. So um, whatever you do here, the right-hand side, even when written in terms of meromorphic functions, the poles cancel out in the end. So this is a quite inter uh, interesting new structure, which goes under the name of quasi Jacobi forms. Yeah. And the statement is that this elliptic chinery we talk about lie in the ring here generated by the ordinary Jacobi forms and a quasi modular form E2 and quasi Jacobi form E1. However, um, you know, we have poles in the game uh, coming from E1. So morally speaking, we also have to have some meromorphic components to divide out and to cancel the poles. This is sort of a symbolic operation I, I just sketched here. So this is the structure of this four-dimensional degenera. And uh, of course, as before, we, we are now up to trying to, to remedy the modular anomalies by introducing slightly non-holomorphic parts and like for E2, that's a well-known substitution which goes to E2 hat. But for E1, there's a similar thing uh, possible. Yeah. Alpha is in Z over in tau. These objects transform nicely. And this then leads to the notion of almost holomorphic Jacobi forms. And that uh, this, these are things, uh, I, I know this from papers by Liebkover, and then it was pretty much extended by, by Oberdeck and Pixton later. So uh, by definition, uh, we, we, we can do the following thing. We, we take a, we have a Jacobi form, have an expansion in non-holomorphic pieces, very simple ones, no complicated mock Jacobi objects, just, just these simple things with a finite number of powers, so finite depth. And the statement is if this phi hat transforms as a Jacobi form uh, nicely, then the holomorphic piece is per definition a quasi Jacobi form. So that this is what, what defines quasi Jacobi form. And this is exactly what these elliptic trainers are. But of course, the physical ones should be modified, uh, you know, to be modern invariant. So they are composed of E1 hat and E2 hat. So that, that, that's the structure of this physical elliptic trainer uh, in four dimensions. Now, um, 
we have been already saying before, uh, there's a novel feature, namely we have elliptic genus, uh, general one with mate minus one, it's given by some, some nice Jacobi form, but then we have this derivative piece here. Uh, and we were just saying, well, we can remedy this, so that, that amounts to changing this derivative into a covariant derivative involving this non-holomorphic parameter. And then the moment you have something non-holomorphic, and again, we can talk about the holomorphic anomaly equation. And that looks, for example, in this case like this, this C minus one hat has P's in it, or an E1 piece in it, and taking a derivative it produces in this piece here. Yeah. And the surprising feature is that G minus uh, moderate minus one flux is a different flux than, than this one. So in other words, the holomorphic anomaly acts between different flux sectors. And that's not just related to the elliptic parameter, but exists also for, for, um, for if you take a tau derivative or im tau derivative. Here, this partition function maps into uh, a zero sector and a weight minus two sector. Yeah. Also, this makes sense only in two dimensions because these objects don't have a good meaning in four dimensions. Yeah. In four dimensions, only the minus one modular weight minus one object has a, has a good definition in terms of elliptic genus. Yeah, but it, there exist more equations of this sort. So in total, we have a kind of um, algebra of anomalies. So we have three different subsectors of fluxes where the partition function have weight zero, minus one, minus two. So the zero one, the partition functions correspond to two dimensional prepotentials. The minus one exists only if you have a U1 flux in the theory, a U1 gauge symmetry, and, and that leads then to a possibility of extra fluxes. So this um, also will give rise to two dimensional prepotential, but it can also be understood as four dimensional genus. And for the minus two, again, we have only the option of having two dimensional prepotential, but there is some kind of indication which I will uh, mention later that it could also possibly be seen as a four dimensional potential. And there you have ex a derivative acting between these sectors. So either E1 or E2 or del im z over im tau or del im tau or tau bar derivative act in this way and derivatives of z and tau act in this way. So this whole action algebra really accommodate the relations of algebra uh, a real algebra is defined on to act on on these different flux sectors. Now, uh, there's another uh, aspect to this, um, namely all of this was um, a mathematical observation and uh, it, it was observed before by Overdick and Pixton in, in a more general abstract algebraic geometric setting. But whenever we talk about holomorphic anomalies, we think, of course, immediately about BCOV, namely Bershatsky, Chikoti, Uguri, Rafa, holomorphic anomalies, uh, very old paper in 93. But that was focused on three folds. So we wanted to look uh, and understand um, what is now different for four folds. Uh, so one can repeat this computation and find the crucial difference. Maybe before there was say you have a correlation function and you have an anti-holomorphic operator insertion with minus one charge. And if it hits a holomorphic operator op uh, operator with charge plus one, then it annihilates uh, identity operator appears. But here now we have new insertions in the correlation function, namely all the background flux. We have a vertex operator inserted and then we have a new type of contact term, namely there's the anti-holomorphic derivative hits the flux vertex operator, which is charge two. So there's an object remaining, which is charge one. And that has interpretation of a gravitational descendant. Yeah. So that's a notion in 2D gravity. And uh, let me rem remind you that you can view this as a kind of uh, dilaton profile in two dimensions. And this is a new piece, which arises only for four faults. Yeah. And you can rephrase this equation in a graphical manner. So we have an abstract correlation function or partition function labeled by flux A, flux sector A, relative with regard to some curve C beta. And then the holomorphic anomaly is a quadratic piece, which corresponds to the usual well-known piece plus this extra piece. Yeah. That reflects, of course, in, in some way, indirectly the 
splitting of a heterotic string into two AD strings. That's sort of the old kind of anomaly, but we have a new piece here from on four folds. So um, what is the physical interpretation? Now this is a bit more shaky. Um, this is more, more tentative. So before the quadratic term in the uh, anomaly equation detects holomorphic uh, non-holomorphic zero modes um, in, 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 the, in, in the binding of two E strings into an heterotic string as, as was figured out uh, many years ago. So that, that's sort of the structure of this equation and that, that is simply this piece del bar of F is a quadratic piece. Yeah? But now the question is of course, is there a meaning of the linear extra term which underlies the, the derivative part of this holomorphic anomaly equation? Now it's a bit uh, tricky and we have just a tentative uh, conjectural interpretation. Namely, um, it seems that these zero modes are always associated with five brains. The five brain appear also here in, in, because if, if you're courageous, you dualize the flux in terms of a five brain language. And there's a certain geometric situation here and there's a, a certain embedded threefold Y3 uh, showing up in the game and uh, there seems to be a component of the modular space which is given by this threefold. And um, one other way of saying this is that this extra term of modular weight minus two looks like, at least in some cases, as elliptic genus uh, of a six dimensional theory. Yeah. So that, that is a natural um, partition function or yeah, partition function of invariance related to this subminimal by three and its modular weight minus two as, as it fits to a six dimensional theory. So it seems to be that roughly speaking, there are zero modes somehow localized on, 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 this, on this space. However, to figure this out uh, more rigorously, it would require a very complicated computation in, in the two dimensional gauge theory in the two dimensional sigma model. Um, which is beyond the scope of this work. At least we have some tentative idea what the region is. And this is also supported by anomaly cancellation because there's now the following issue. The, the elliptic genus serves as sort of uh, the building block for the Green-Schwarz anomaly cancellation. Yeah? The, the Green-Schwarz term is essentially given by a modular integral of the elliptic genus. Now, if we have suddenly a modified elliptic genus, which is not even nicely modular and has extra terms and so on, uh, how does it interfere with anomaly cancellation? The point is that uh, there are extra massless states arising from this hidden six dimensional sector, which are also there. And exactly their contribution to the green schwarz mechanism is, is taken care of by this uh, extra derivative piece. So that this, this is not generally proven, but, but at least in examples verified. So th that seems to be the story. Hidden, there's a surprising six dimensional structure, which has uh, some non-modular behavior. If you repair the modularity by non-holomorphic pieces, then you get a holomorphic anomaly. Uh, if you consider uh, holomorphic anomaly equations and this focuses on this piece, and this is in a way, it, it, it's a six dimensional subsector of the theory. So you see this a surprisingly complicated structure. Also, you would think that elliptic general and four dimensions should be extremely simple, but they are not. Now, uh, let's come back to the uh, gravity conjecture. So this is just a statement. The elliptic genus actually is, is a nicely, a nice Jacobi piece plus some extra derivative piece. And now if this wouldn't be there, the last part, this would be a weight minus one modular form, Jacobi form. And because it's anti-symmetric, um, you have certain cancellations in the chart like this. So you would have this structure and exactly you would not have any super extremal states and you would have actually complete empty rows here. So that would be in violation of the um, lattice conjecture. Also, one would one should point out, of course, two caveats. One is, of course, we talk about index here. So a zero here or non-existence of a state is not necessarily 
that it sta that states don't exist, but it could be just a cancellation. And also the thing is highly non-perturbative and, and it's not so clear how much we have it really under control. So th th these are caveats, but at least it's reassuring to see that the missing piece here restores all the missing states. Uh, one should be, uh, um, however, aware of that these things have coefficients in them which depend on the fluxes. So one has always the possibility of choosing a flux where this term is not there and then we are back in this situation. But the generic flux situation will, will have sort of um, this property uh, that we have a lattice of super extreme states and uh, the charge lattice being fully occupied. Okay, so let me come to the conclusion summary. We have been seeing that the elliptic genera in four dimension have surprisingly these complex features. First of all, uh, IU1 is necessary, otherwise they, 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 they don't exist. And then they are given by right minus one jo quasi Jacobi forms. And uh, non perturbative versions can be constructed by duality to F theory, and there one can make limits. Uh, so that we obtain tensionless heterotic strings or other non perturbative objects in certain limits. And we can compute the chromo witten invariants for these subsectors. And these chromo witten invariants um, are defined in relation to the, the space curves and, and the flux background. And, and with them, one can compute the elliptic genera of these uh, solitonic strings. Then, a surprising extra feature is that these elliptic generas have extra the derivative structure uh, such that they are not really nicely modular. Um, they have an extra piece which, which looks like a elliptic genus of a hidden six dimensional sector. And uh, associated with this, there are also new kinds of modular anomaly, holomorphic anomalies whose physical interpretation is not entirely clear so far. And there can be physics applications. First of all, we have been seeing that it's vaguely consistent with the gravity conjectures and also with anomaly cancellation. That's all I want to say. Thank you. Thanks, Ulukan, for this great talk. So we're having question time. So over to just have questions then. Uh, Wolfgang, how, uh, what determines Y3? Sorry, what? Uh, what determines Y3 which sits inside the fourfold? The three, four yeah. inside the yeah, there, there's a certain vibration structure. Um, I, I could show a picture, but it wouldn't tell you much. It doesn't depend on the fluxes. Uh, no, no, it's 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 just in in the in the fourfold. It's just a property of the fourfold. Okay. Yeah. So um, that, that's a bit of a miracle why this shows up. But if you think carefully um, in four dimensional theories, you can have more massless states than, than naive ones. Uh, uh, there are certain submanifolds on, on which uh, brains can wrap and, and exactly these extra states in four dimensions need to have uh, their own anomaly cancellation mechanism. So in this way, it, it works together. Uh, hi, uh, I just had a quick question uh, and rather a curiosity. Is there any connection between the fact that the Grubau Witten variants have an intrinsic G4 dependence and the fact that if you want to extend uh, or use mirror symmetry for n equals one with D brains, you, uh, one uses a uh, relative homology or you talk about uh, yeah. a, a special Lagrangian three cycles and the mirrors? This is a good question because uh, I was thinking about this at some point. Yeah namely open string. I mean, there, there should be an open string uh, variant of this and all what I was saying, in, in, and morally speaking, there should be also open string backgrounds um, in the sense of D-brains and color house um, and all of these anomaly equations and one should have also the interpretation of open strings. And very roughly speaking, I would think that a correlation function with a flux insertion corresponds to some other uh, correlation function in the open string sector where the label of the flux then is a boundary condition. Um, becomes an, defines an open string sector. So very naively, I would expect that, that these anomaly equations can also be written where flux, roughly speaking, is, is, is related, is, 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 is uh, relabeled in terms of an open string. Uh, and maybe even by, by sort of dualizing a four flux into some five brain or something like that. 
um, uh, this can be more made more concrete. But indeed, um, there's, there should be a completely um, open string. I mean, you know, we have also open string holomorphic anomaly equation for three faults. And, and, and there's now a corresponding question for how does it look for four faults? Or, or, yeah. In other words, no, let's put it differently. Open string holomorphic anomaly equation for three faults should be somehow related to this here. Yeah. So there's an overlap of dualism, and some theories are. Have, have got a good uh, flux uh, described by uh, fourfold compactifications, FT compactifications with four, four flux and other compactifications should be described by three folds, just ordinary one with D brains on top, and there should be some overlap. And, and that's an interesting thing, we think, to investigate indeed. Thank you. Other questions? Um, just a comment. Um, I wondered why nobody asked why aren't there any chromophytic invariants for genus larger than one? Because naively you, you would think, oops, no, naively you would think why um, forfoot should have more structures, why, why are there less invariants to talk about? So um, I, I think it's only a, physic, a stupid physicist's remark, namely, roughly speaking, N equal one theories in four dimensions or N equal two in two dimensions, there are no other holomorphic functions. There are no BPS objects which would be uh, um, encoded in some holomorphic functions. I mean, in N equal two and four dimensions, you have the higher FGs, you know, these higher genus invariants mapped to some pieces in FEG Lagrangian, higher FGs, uh, F terms. But these things don't exist for N equal one. So in other words, there is no use for higher genus invariants in, in physics. That's why. But in the dimension them. formula, there was a plus n, right? So if g minus one minus g is negative, yeah, but n put, can be positive, right? And yeah, yeah, then, but then you put extra stuff, uh, extra yeah. vertex operators in there. Uh, yeah. Extra vertex operators, yes. yeah. Then you can get something. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. I have a. I have a sort of a very nice question about this physics application part of this non perturbative anomaly cancellation. So it is uh, probably you're talking about this gauge gravitational anomalies. So is there some field theory analog of this? Could there be any uh, any any field theory? So if, uh, instead of looking in string theory, some kind of field theory analog of this, where you have a non perturbative mechanism. Whether? Um, I'm just trying to see some kind of nice place where uh, where was this picture here? So indeed, you can have a mixed anomaly you want with, gra with gravitons too. Yeah. So the relevant piece, uh, the, the piece relevant to the big genius is this one. Now, if field theory doesn't know about this, field theory. Um, um, in field theory, um, this count, the, the, the green schwarz anomaly considering is not defined. I mean, you put it by hand and, and the coefficient is not determined. You, you just put it like this as you like. In string theory, this is a, uh, is a amplitude which has a definite uh, coefficient, just the right coefficient actually. Yeah. So um, the elliptic genus goes into this one. So in field theory, you don't have that much, um, I mean, there's no way really to, to make some kind of statements here because it's completely arbitrary. The U1 flux is uh, defining the elliptic genus, as you explained. Yeah, the U1 is, is, is yeah. it, you could say it as a different, in different way. The chiral anomalies in four dimensions is a cubic thing, yeah? But modular invariance and actually the structure of string theory implies that is not a cubic thing, but it's trace Q times trace Q square. So it all this oh, factors. Okay, positive, I see. Yeah? Um, and, and that, I mean, all possible uh, anomalies in string theory uh, have this factorized structure and that, that's why green schwartz works. In an arbitrary field theory, you would not have this factorized structure. And then you cannot cancel the anomaly. I see, that's why the elliptic in general is really relevant and uh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Any further question?
okay if not uh, let's thank will kang again for for his for, for his nice time uh, for, for for his time in giving this talk we all enjoyed it <laughs> thank you so shall we go off? okay <laughs> Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, so have a nice evening then, and see you soon back. For well, the next mid talk. afternoon here, but uh, yes. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 <laughs> Where is now? How do I go out here? Okay. Um.